The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. You ever feel like you should be doing better? Like say you're a parent and you think you should be spending more time with your kids. Or maybe you should be spending less time with them. Or maybe you're a teacher and find yourself getting anxious at times, thinking that some of the children in your classroom aren't where they should be academically. Or maybe it's something broader, like you, know, you should be doing more as a wife or as a husband. Or possibly it's even bigger than that, like real big. You should be doing more with your life. So these are just a few examples of what the late psychologist Dr. Karen Horney called the tyranny of the should, which we'll talk about today and cover practical ways to deal with in our own lives. Now, related to these kind of inner dictates or expectations, Dr. Maria Montessori, who, who actually lived during the same time period as Dr. Horney, she once said, quote, the real preparation for education is a study of one's self, end of quote. Dr. Montessori believed, and I strongly agree with her on this, that looking inward, whether as a teacher or as a parent, is just as important as looking outward at children. So with that said, I'm going to start off here with a personal story from my early 20s. Before I really understood child development, I, I used to be a teach, you know, traditional elementary school. And one year I had a group of fourth graders for history class there was this super sweet girl, so I'm gonna call her Emily, such a joy to be around. But she was basically failing the class. She just could not you know, keep up with her peers, as they say. So I'm curious, like with this scenario, traditional schooling, what would you do with a child like Emily? So maybe if she's really, you know, quote, behind, you'd hold her back a grade. Well, that wasn't practical here because Emily was socially just really sophisticated, so probably more fitted with children older than younger. So third grade just wasn't an option. So maybe tutoring? Yeah, we, we did that. And Emily she tried so hard. I mean, she put in just all the effort in the world. I mean, you could see it in her eyes when she was working. But she just could not handle the material. I'm just like, I'm thinking back on this now and it gets me a little, a little bit upset, a little bit teary. I mean, she just wasn't ready for fourth grade in traditional schooling. Her reading and writing skills were not there. So that's the context here. Now I want you to imagine you were this girl's parents. You just want your little girl to do well. So what now? Well, how about saying something like this to her, as the mom actually did? You're such a bright girl, Emily. You can get an A in this class. I know you can. You can do anything you put your heart to. And if, if you get an A on this next report card, we're going to get you a puppy. Now, before anyone goes condemning Emily's mom for this, I want you to think about the way in which many of us were raised as kids. You know, so if you just put in a little more effort, I mean, everything you got, don't be lazy. You can do it. You can get any grade you want. I mean, at some point as a teacher, like I kind of believe this. So you see some of us, like Emily's mom, were ourselves brought up on this kind of nonsense that motivational speeches and awesome treats solve any problem. Now they don't, of course. Like the fact is children develop differently and so will perform differently at different stages and ages. So what did Emily then actually gain here from all of this? From you know, mom basically telling her that if she just tried harder, she would succeed. Well, I'd say Emily gained a should. You should be able to do better. And this kind of baggage is not fun to carry around and at any age. As Dr. Montessori once said, quote, nothing is more discouraging than to have before one an unattainable ideal 
an example impossible to imitate, end of quote. That Emily was supposed to forget about the girl she actually was, to her true abilities at that time, and instead magically perform at the level her mother thought children of her age should perform at. Like, this is the tyranny of the should. Here, unintentionally handed down from a mother, you know, kind of trying to do what's right for her daughter. And it's sad. Now, I don't want to make this out to be like the end of the world. You know, Emily is scarred for life or something. I mean, my prediction actually is, given what an awesome character this girl had, is that she is doing just fine now. She was way too positive to let any shoulds ultimately hold her back. But many of us are still hanging on to our own shoulds, a different kind of impossible expectations, whether from way back in our own childhood or from more recent times. So then what exactly is this tyranny of the should? So according to Dr. Horney, it's when we create an unrealistic ideal of what we should be like and then go and try to live up to that. So in one of her books, she describes such an individual. Quote, he should be the utmost of honesty, generosity, considerateness, justice, dignity, courage, unselfishness. He should be able to endure everything, should like everybody, should love his parents, his wife, his country, or he should not be attached to anything or anybody. Nothing should matter to him. He should never feel hurt, and he should always be serene and unruffled. He should always enjoy life, or he should be above pleasure and enjoyment. He should be spontaneous. He should always control his feelings. He should know, understand, and foresee everything. He should be able to solve every problem of his own or of others in no time. He should be able to overcome every difficulty of his as soon as he sees it. He should never be tired or fall ill. He should always be able to find a job. He should be able to do things in one hour, which can only be done in two to three hours. End of quote. All right, so any of these should sound familiar to you? I have definitely had some and at times definitely still do. I'll actually give you one that I realized just recently. It's, it's, it's about you guys tuning in here and it, it goes something like, I should make all the listeners happy. Of course, that is impossible, but it didn't stop me from believing it in some form. Like you see, about a week ago, I received an email that said, and I'm going to quote it, Quote, I have lost a lot of respect for you after this episode, end of quote. So among other things, the writer then, she goes on to criticize my loud-mouthed guest. This is her words, not mine. Now, I wasn't happy about this. This is pretty frustrating. But there was a moment where I felt a little bit guilty, like I had let this listener down. Then I thought, wait, wait a second, like first, is what she's saying even true? Because that's important. And second, not everyone has to agree with me. Not everyone has to like everything or every episode I put on. Like, that was pretty relieving. Uh, I basically stood up to the should. I used my own judgment to question its truth or validity. And it's funny because incidentally, like literally a day or two later, someone else writes me with feedback praising that very same episode. So you cannot please everyone. I can't please everyone. But that fact doesn't stop the should. It keeps pushing until we push back with some objectivity about it all. Another example of the tyranny of the should and a much more extreme one is told by a New York City psychologist named Dr. Alan Blumenthal. Quote, A young man, the only son of a highly successful businessman, was, as a child, told by his father that he had no head for business and that he would probably have to be supported for the rest of his life. As you can see here, it's the opposite of Emily. Now, feeling humiliated by his father's judgment, he determined to demonstrate his ability. At the age of 20... He became a commodities trader and set the goal of a net worth of $3 million by the time he was 23, a goal he pursued compulsively and actually achieved. However, telling himself that the value of $3 million had been eroded by inflation, he set out on a new mission, 
to amass $6 million by the age of 25. That, too, he accomplished. But his fortune did not achieve the desired effect. Although he demonstrated his success to his father, he did not feel any more secure. He knew that some other traders were making even more money and that $6 million was, as he cockily expressed it, chicken feed. Five years later, with a net worth of $20 million, he found himself still driven, still unsatisfied, and still self-doubtful. Ultimately, being intelligent, he realized that he was, as he expressed it, frantically trying to fill his pail with self-esteem, only to discover that there was a large hole in the bottom. End of quote. Do you see how this man set up an impossible ideal for himself, what he should be, and then kept chasing the phantom? Again, this is an extreme example, but I want to hammer home that these tyrannical shoulds can be harmful and that we all have them in some form or another, whether they're relatively minor like mine, unpleasing listeners, or very big like this guy's. So a natural question at this point, what specific shoulds do each of us have? And how do we get rid of them? Uh, Not easy to answer. And in 20 minutes or so, I'm surely not going to unearth and eliminate everyone's shoulds, let alone my own. But we can get a far away with just a little. So I'm going to give a couple steps to aid. One, as individuals, we have to know what we want. And this is separate from what others might want of us. As the wonderful Mr. Rogers once said on his show, quote, nobody owns us. We are our own person, end of quote. And he really meant that for everyone at, at any age. But if we don't truly get this, like trouble arises. Dr. Horney says it interestingly. She, she says, quote, nature abhors a vacuum. When your own wishes are silent, those of others rush in, end of quote. And here's an example she gives along with that. Quote, one patient had sleepless nights because he could not decide whether he should go with his wife on a short vacation or stay in his office and work. Should he measure up to his wife expectations or to the alleged expectations of his employer? The question as to what he wanted most did not enter his mind at all. And on the basis of the should, The matter simply could not be decided, end of quote. So for us now, in our own lives, we got to decide. So what do you want? Like forget about the tyrant and his shoulds and just think about or even write out a list of what you genuinely want in your own unique life. So if you want some nicer things, then you want some nicer things. Or if you want to weigh less, then you want to weigh less. Or maybe you want to weigh more. I don't know. If you love your husband and maybe you have like this kind of beautiful engagement ring that you treasure, write that down. Or if you're not married, but you'd like to be one day, then get that out. If you're a parent, I mean, your children are probably top values, but just be sure everything isn't about them. For instance, maybe you want more date nights alone. Actually, maybe you want more sex in your life you know, or less sex. I, I don't know. Just get it all out. Don't worry about what your mom would say or what your partner would say or about what society says. Like none of that. I like to think of it as like go big or go home, as they say. Now, I actually regularly update my own list like this in, in something called a hierarchy of values. And so here are a few from that. Work, my girl, being around other loved ones, so friends, family, my dog, Bjorn. I I wanna travel more, specifically to visit Thailand and India. And then there are things like books, classic Mustang, which I don't yet have, by the way, Uh, great sushi, there's much more, but I think you get the point. Um, So knowing what we want, writing down our values, and actually making sure they don't conflict, which is a whole other story, But this actually is not enough. So another step we have to take is going after them, putting in the work to gain and hold on to what truly makes us happy, which does not happen automatically. Dr. Blumenthal talks about this too. Quote, 
It may seem self-evident that seeking fulfillment and happiness in life is a universal goal, but sadly, it is not so. There are alternatives. One option is a life of duty. Duty to parents, to family, to children, to ancestors, to God, to society, to various causes. Then there are duties to oneself, to practice virtues of all kinds, to be rational, to be conscientious, to be self-disciplined, to fulfill responsibilities. Of course, these are legitimate and significant qualities, but when viewed as duties, they become ends in themselves. Incidentally, this is that tyranny of the should right there. Their implicit goal is to achieve virtue, to score points, as it were, with no prospect of reward, except perhaps a headstone that reads, he always did the right thing. End of quote. So we have to both know what we want and go after it. Instead of wasting time with duties or bowing down to you know, possible shoulds, whether others or our homemade own. Now again, this kind of thing is, is not easy, but even just getting started can be pretty powerful because as we openly look within to improve, and this is and regardless of any drama we, that we may find, we're always then gaining and growing. Here's Dr. Horney on the journey. Quote, you must not study only the highlights. You must take every opportunity to become familiar with this stranger or acquaintance that is yourself. This, by the way, is not a figurative way of speaking, for most people know very little about themselves and only gradually learn to what extent they have lived in ignorance. If you want to know New York, you do not merely look at it from the Empire State Building. You go to the Lower East Side. You stroll through Central Park. You take a boat around Manhattan. You ride on Fifth Avenue bus and a great deal more. Opportunities to become familiar with yourself will offer themselves, and you will see them, provided you really want to know this queer fellow who lives your life. You will then be astonished to see that here you are irritated for no apparent reason. There you cannot make up your mind. Here you were offensive without meaning to be. Here you mysteriously lost your appetite. There you had an eating spell. Here you could not bring yourself to answer a letter. There you were suddenly afraid of noises around you when you were alone. Here you had a nightmare. There you felt hurt or humiliated. Here you could not ask for a raise in salary or express a critical opinion. All these infinite observations represent that many entrances to the unfamiliar ground that is yourself. You start to wonder, which here too is the beginning of all wisdom. End of quote. So wrapping up, I want to share a quick story told by a kind of uh, depressing character from the show Westworld. This is a man who doesn't think he can direct his own destiny. Quote, when I was just a little boy, my parents took me to the circus. I wanted to see the elephants, these mighty creatures. They held them in place with a stake, you know, kind of like a wooden peg. Those elephants... They could tear a tree right out of the ground. And yet, a simple stake kept them in place. Well, I didn't understand. And then, my father told me. He said, The stakes were used when the elephants were just young. They were too small to pull them up. And so the animals never tried to pull them up again. End of quote. So this man is comparing the elephants, who literally can't change themselves, to us as human beings. Now, I disagree with him, of course. For, for one, we're not elephants, right? We can reject false beliefs. We can root out our own metaphorical stake that might be holding us back. In this case, you know, the tyranny of the should. We can toss it aside, get moving, and take full control of our lives. As Dr. Montessori herself once so eloquently put it, quote, man is a sculptor of himself, end of quote. And here's Dr. Horney with a similarly uplifting analogy, quote, the more we face our own conflicts and seek out our own solutions, the more inner freedom and strength we will gain. Only when we are willing to bear the brunt can we approximate the ideal of being the captain of our ship. End of quote. 
I really like that one. I think Dr. R and I like like Dr. Montessori. That she has a way with words. Uh, and a few closing words from actually from another doctor, but this one is the playful Dr. Seuss quote. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who will decide where to go. End of quote. All right, that is it for today. A huge thanks to the listeners who have rated and reviewed the show. I am loving seeing those come through. And since you've made it all the way to the end with me, I have something extra to share. I put together a simple PDF on creating your own hierarchy of values, and it's got a few of the quotes I used referenced there, too. Uh, you can find that in the podcast episode notes through MontessoriEducation.com. 